Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new installment of Club Muffet Talks. I'm your host, Chris. And I am Ryan. And we're joined today by our good friend, Interlibrary Loan. What's your official title, Joe? I think that it is manager. I Interlibrary think Loan I am, manager. Yes. Well, because I'm a library assistant three, and I'm not an, a librarian, but I'm the head of the department. So I think manager. Uh, most of our department heads are librarians, so they can be called whatever the department is, librarian. Uh, but I don't have that title yet. So can I call myself government documents manager? Yes, yes you can. Ah, ha, ha. All right. Well, that's what I am now. <laughs> uh, Joseph McNeely, uh, we've been wanting to get you on here for a little while now. I'm really glad that you can join us. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about what ILL is, because we kind of just mentioned it, but uh, there are some listeners who might not be fully aware of, of this, frankly, really amazing service that we offer. It is a really amazing service. Uh, it's usually abbreviated ILL. It stands for Interlibrary Loans, and it is a program that allows us to get materials from other libraries. We also loan our materials to other libraries, but that means that when you want a book or an article or a DVD, you are not necessarily limited to what we currently have on the shelf because we have through ILL access to basically the holdings of every library on the planet. That's right. Yeah, and, and not only <clears throat> not only physical items, but we can do like articles and Yes. It's from, from the place that I came from, we also scanned pages out of some, like if, if a student just wanted like, I, I need a chapter or like 10 pages out of this reference book, we would go and scan that for them. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, I never used this service when I was in college and now I'm actually in a library. I don't, I don't need to go talk to someone. I can just ask you like, Hey, can we, can you get this for me? But um, when I was in college, there were so many opportunities that I really could have taken advantage of by really knowing fully what ILL was. And uh, I know that you're looking to kind of expand knowledge of, of what we offer here. And uh, I think that's a, a tremendous idea. Yeah, it's it's something that has uh, become even more useful during the pandemic because where it may be difficult to get access to a complete book, it may be easier to get individual chapters digitally sent to you uh, from that same book. Uh, because even though things are starting to open up now, uh, especially now that we've actually have some vaccines available and things, mm -hmm. there are still some libraries that are not loaning their physical items at all, but they are happy to do scanning. So if if you can, you know, realize that you actually just need chapter three from that reference book, we can get it for you. Plus there's the fact that reference books do not check out. They cannot leave yes. this building. Yes. We're more than happy to offer you like a, if you need something out of that chapter. I mean, it's not like you have to return printed out pages back right. to us. Uh, not only that, but I mean, it really is as easy as just saying, I need this thing on our uh, on our database. Could you get it for me? And I mean, we'll we'll have that emailed out to you in like an hour, maybe depending yeah, on I, if if we get a request from one of our patrons for something that we have that we have electronic access to because we have a digital copy of the material or we have access to the website for that uh, text, then yes, we can get it to you the same day. Uh, and sometimes yes, within just a few minutes, uh, especially if I happen to notice when your request comes in and I go, oh, hey, I can take care of that. Uh, we have had requests filled in minutes. We cannot guarantee that that is that is not always the case. Sometimes it takes a while, especially if we have to send the request on to another library. 
Well, I'll say what I usually say when I'm teaching about interlibrary loan. Um, there's so many factors involved. People like to know exactly how long it's going to take to get a hold of something. And unfortunately, there are so many factors involved. There is when you send the request in, when Joe goes home for the day, when Joe has lunch, if Joe is out because he's sick, um, if the person he's lending it from is on vacation, uh, if he has to go to multiple different libraries and try to find the, that particular item where they're willing to lend it. Um, how many of the items are there? If there's only three libraries in the world that have it, it becomes much more difficult to actually get a hold of that particular item. So these are all factors that have it. Um, usually though, one of the things you can do is you can go into a, a database if you're looking for a book called WorldCat. And one of the things WorldCat will do is let you know what libraries have it besides us. First off, WorldCat will let you know if we have it, the first off, but it'll also let you know what other libraries in, in, the, in the world have it. And you can request interlibrary loan through WorldCat once you pull it up. Now, one of the things that's been nice thing about WorldCat and knowing what libraries have it, if somebody here in Texas, it's a public library or a, or, a, uh, or a public school library has it, it usually is very easy for us to get a hold of it. If somebody like North Texas has it, we can usually get it as early as the next day sometimes. So that's usually what I tell the classes. Is it, 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 how long it will take is it dependent upon a lot, a lot of factors. I also mentioned the fact that one of my good friends that I went to college with did an interlibrary loan request for a, for a book. There's only one copy of it in the world. It's in Iceland, in Icelandic. <laughs> interlibrary loan got a hold of it for him. It took four months, but he did receive the actual book through interlibrary loan. That's amazing. Well, consider something like that would be a hundred years ago. That would be an adventure. You know, I need to get my hands on on the this ancient text that technically statistically doesn't exist in the world. I'm going to make my trek to Iceland and now it's like the Internet's going to get me the thing that that's. Yeah, I don't well, know. I'm, that's a thing, too, because if you. I, I don't want to get way deep into it, but if you look at the history of interlibrary loans, ILL has existed on the earth since before the printing press. Good. So there were libraries where they literally had scribes that hand wrote what you wanted and then sent it to you. So, you know, we, we, we've been doing this a while. I mean, not me personally, but yeah, well. as, as an, <laughs> as, as an industry, as you know, as a system, it's been around a long time. That's that's really just amazing. No, I'm I'm doing a uh, a little bit of history of libraries right now in my uh, in my class. Listeners, I'm still I'm still in library school. I'm about to tear my flesh off, I think, but I'm still doing it. Um, there was a big section on just the history of libraries and basically what we think of as the modern library really began in like the 1860s in England. It's it's really kind of fascinating just how in the last few years, it's it's mostly just been like perfecting these things that were already created almost 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and, and that is the thing about libraries is that libraries have grown and changed over the years, and I think that it's the nature of the, the service. Libraries are a service industry, and they serve their particular communities. Uh, you know, a school library serves a school, a, a city library serves its city, you know, so each library has its own community but you serve that community. And as communities have grown and changed their makeup, libraries have changed their services to, to, to match that. And uh, I mean, if, if, if they didn't, then libraries would stagnate and die. Uh, you know, <coughs> sometimes people talk about the death of the library. That's not gonna happen. Oh uh, no, never. You know, uh, as long as we have people, we're going to have libraries because those people are going to need services that the library provides open access is, yes that's the that's the current um fancy word right now so what are you up to these days joe what are you doing for fun anything that's catching your eye well for fun uh i've been watching some tv shows and things and and some movies we got the what is it uh i am not a spokesperson <laughs> but we, we got we got to, it was HBO Max because and it has a lot of the uh, DC comics TV shows and movies uh, and I've been watching those 
and they also have a section that has classic movies uh, with a decent international selection. And I've mm -hmm. been going in and watching the Lone Wolf and Cub movies, mm -hmm. which are uh, old samurai movies. They have almost, well, the, not almost all Kurosawa movies, but they have a good, like, six or seven really high-profile Akira Kurosawa movies. Um, yeah, no, I love HBO Max. I'm not I'm not actually using that. I pay for HBO through Hulu. So um, uh, uh -huh. recently we've been watching The Sopranos. Oh. And I don't know if many of our listeners have watched The Sopranos. I don't know if either of you have watched The Sopranos. Um, I've... I've often heard that described as the greatest TV show of all time. Um, I will say that that is worth an HBO Max subscription. Hmm. Uh, but between that and The Wire, I really don't know which one I prefer right now. I need to finish The Sopranos. But holy crap, that show completely uh, withstands its barrage of, of um, overly generous praise, I think. That show I, is probably perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh really you went with it, the perfect I, I i'm gonna that, say that shows totally perfect wow. I, don't, I thought you saved that only for the great the great and powerful david lynch but okay um there are very lynchian moments in that show that people don't really are probably would not expect out of the gangster show uh there are very well done dream sequences and i not even dream sequences but dreamy like m character moments no i it's it's perfect uh, I don't know if I like it more than Twin Peaks, but I it, I would call it a top three ever for me. But what else you got, Joe? Uh, but, well, like you, I am also doing library graduate school. Uh, this is my last semester. Yay! Oh, awesome! I'm actually about to do the uh, end of program thing, which is... Uh, I think that because you came in significantly, not, I mean, significantly, like a, a couple of years after I did, you're, you're going to have a different thing. I a think you're having like a digital portfolio or something. Yeah. My EOP is actually uh, where I have to write three papers uh, in seven days. They'll give, me, they'll give me a list of 10 topics and I will pick three of those and have to write three papers in seven days. Are you taking I, time off for that? I am. I'm taking off. It, it starts at 8 a.m. tomorrow, oh, and I'm God. taking off tomorrow through all of next week um, to, to get it to done. There are specific rules for it about the number of words as far as the length. The main thing is that you need to make sure that you answer all the parts of the question. It has to be intelligible, logical, and it has to be properly cited because if it doesn't make sense or if it is any in any way uh, plagiarized or if it doesn't answer the question, then you would fail it. Good Lord. It's and interesting. It's not graded. It's literally just pass fail. Oh, it's by the way, uh, sorry, Ryan, real quick. By the way, Joe, um, I did point um, some of my professors to this podcast uh, last semester. So, hello. We love we love our uh, our uh, library program. It's so fun. I love it. I I have had a lot of really good classes doing the program through UNT. Uh, I have enjoyed one or two professors so much that I deliberately took more than one of their classes. Oh. You know, on purpose. Uh, I've only had one professor that I did not care for, which we've talked about in private and I will not discuss here. <coughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Ryan, you were saying <laughs> something? I was trying to say it's interesting to see how this has changed over time because, again, I got my, um, I got my degree back in the Paleolithic era. And uh, back in the Paleolithic era, I actually had like a bar exam at the end of the year where I had to prove that I knew everything. It was like a three-hour exam I had to take that um, – where it was basically I had to prove that I knew all the different aspects of librarianship. It was everything from a small essay to um, uh, uh, like yes, no answer type type stuff. And so it's interesting that we move from that to more of a can you write an article to now can you develop a portfolio? Can you develop a um, 
uh, something that uh, that uh, can be given to a prospective uh, employer uh, to look at and stuff like that. So it's interesting to see how they've shifted sort of from a professional to an academic to more of a business based um, end of, you know, end of end of term graduation uh, exam type type. I, I feel like that the program is a good program and I do think that they have changed it over the years to match what's going on essentially in the world. Uh, but one thing that they do is that they have as as a requirement of graduation is that they have the students do a, a, a practicum, which is essentially on the job training. So you actually work in a library for a period of time to get that experience and to make sure that you know what you're doing. Because I already work in a library, I was able to have that practicum waived. But I appreciate that they have that as part of the program. Yeah, you know, it almost feels like like some of those elements were, I guess, made redundant almost because of the workload in those classes. Like yeah. you, you do write your papers in classes and you do show that you know how to uh, how to search through databases and, and can use different aspects of the library. So then to have like an exam or something to that effect at the very end is like kind of retreading old ground. Yeah. So at first, I mean, I, I'm anxious about every single thing in the world, but uh, uh, I, I didn't know how to feel about the this portfolio that I have to do now. But now seeing it as like we're helping you to get like more than the next step in in applying for a library job, like we, we as much as as lead you through the process of having everything prepared for you. I can kind of see that, like especially people. I know that there are some people in in my program who have never stepped foot in a library and who are really interested in getting in the field. Uh, those people probably will need a little more help uh, in in showing like their skills and and what they accomplished throughout uh, throughout that program. So, I I don't think. I mean, I I've been working in libraries for eight years, so I don't know how. I feel about it personally, but for everyone else, like for just the general program, it, it does seem like a really good step in the right direction. I'll also say this, uh, at least for North Texas, how it was when I was at school there, again, back in the Paleolithic era, um, it was kind of in their best interest to do this as well, because it was a really good way for them to get really good um, student workers in the libraries, because what they would do is they said, oh, if you can't get a job at another library in your area, you can always come to work for us here at North Texas, and we'll have you be a paraprofessional at the reference desk. So um, oh. it was a way for North Texas kind of to to fill out their uh, their student workers with actual uh, grad students who are going to library school. So. Yeah, tra trained, quote, <laughs> quote unquote, professionals. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so again, I know we've we've had difficulties with uh, manning the reference desk here. Who should do it? Uh, how important it is. In fact, uh, I don't know if you guys heard that or not, but during the first few minutes of this uh, of this uh, podcast, the the reference desk phone was going off. So whoever supposed to have was supposed to have forwarded their their phone this morning did not do it. Um, so uh, again, it is a problem we have. And again, that is an easy solution. We'll just make our grad students sit at the reference desk for us. Um, so yeah, no, we we heard you doing that, but we we managed to to talk for several minutes without you. So thank you. I didn't answer it. I thought about it, but I didn't answer it. Yeah, so in the Paleolithic era, did you have to um, fight off gigantic 20 foot tall armored carapace centipedes? Mm -hmm. uh, no, but we did have lots of homeless people coming into the building um, uh, trying to use the Internet at the time. Oh, OK. See, because we also that, had to teach people how to use a mouse, which was also very interesting, too. Uh, so now, they'd now, say, so oh, go here and click on this. And they look at me like, what are you Paleolithic about? and then go and using the Internet. Yeah, no, that's yeah. You know, if you want to talk about how you were friends with Paul Revere and you shoot his horse or something, that's fine. But, you know, oh, back in the dark ages and then Internet. But see, that that, it, that doesn't that doesn't go together. Now, see what you what you just did, Ryan, was that you committed a sin against the very setting that you created. Now, I will, I will point out, though, for Generation Z, 
the internet was around 10 years before they were born. So again, <laughs> it is the Paleolithic for them. So again, just to remind you, even though you two feel young, you're very, very old. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Stop it. I was trying to do something. And, and you've instead destroyed the very fragile shield protecting my mind this morning. What I was going to say was, Ryan... <laughs> That giant 20-foot tall armored carapace giant centipedes is something that you would see, I mean, that is something that's real. Like, that's that happened. But that's something that you would see in, like, a, I don't know, like a fantasy novel, you know? <laughs> like, a, like something... Really smooth, smooth, it's very smooth, it. and then and then you um, and then you shot that centipede with an armored tank. So um, we're actually here. Surprise! We're here to talk to everyone about uh, a topic that I think we're all moderately interested in. That we're all that we all like quite a bit, and that's genre transition segue. <laughs> transition active. <laughs> Please watch your step. There is a transition happening. Mind the gap. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. For those of who are completely clueless, we talked for a long time about how we wanted to transition from talking about, you know, things to eventually the topic of today, which is going to be genre. And uh, we've talked about how we can make this as smooth as possible. And obviously we ruined that terribly. We made it the most horrible transition ever, but I think we're going to keep it in because it's wonderful. That, okay, that that segue <laughs> turned into a segue like the kind that you ride. It became slow, lumbering, and ultimately useless. You know, okay. a segue is almost something like out of a out of a lame sci-fi. <laughs> like, like imagine Blade Runner, but instead of flying cars, everyone has segways, and that's like the the ultimate technological advance. Something I've almost like a science fiction novel, huh? Almost. Uh, yeah, this this future, this sci-fi future sucks. I hate it. It's it's quite boring. Uh, I, but I yeah, I we actually love in science fiction genres where it is obviously futuristic, but where they use low tech because. It's still the best way to to navigate the problem. I mean, like you have your dystopian futuristic city with the flying cars, and uh, they've actually just you know built some sort of scaffolding over the old city. for the author to hang a story off of. And um, so again, it can lead to really terrible stuff that way as well. But I think that's mostly what it is. It's a way for the author and to find the right audience to some extent. Um, and it's, it's, it's about making money ultimately is what genre is about uh, to some extent. So, but, but back with the Greeks, it was okay. This begins and ends with a wedding, therefore it's a comedy. This begins and ends with uh, with a funeral, it's a tragedy. And we're just going to fit some stuff between that to fit the theme. Whereas now, genre's gotten a little muddy, I think. Yes. Yeah, it's also the fact that instead of, instead again, you have multiple ways of doing things. Uh, you brought up the Greeks, I can also bring up the Japanese. You had no theater. You have the uh, Kabuki theater. You have the puppet theater, and you have like the 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 prose theater. Those are the four main types of Japanese theater are, and each one of them fits a different type of of structure, and and has different types of stories to tell. Um, and I forgot completely forgot what I was going with this. But the <laughs> idea is that um, that people know what they're looking coming in for. They know what they're going to get. I think it's more than just just the tropes of it. It's the fact that um, you have these set ways of doing things. You have these rules for how to do things correctly or how to do things in the right way. And rules were very important to people back in the day. And again, I think one of the problems, here's what I was going to get into. One of the problems we have today is instead of having the, the, the rules in place and people following the rules, I think nowadays what we're having is, oh, here's this thing. 
what is this thing? Let's stick it over into this cubby hole or into this group or into this box. That way we can define it. So instead of instead of the, the genre defining the work, I think now the work is defining the genre. So I think that's the difference between how it was in the past and how it is now. Well, gentlemen, I have a I have a very <clears throat> divisive question for both of you that I think I think I can ask this in, in very few words. What genre is Star Wars? <laughs> Space fantasy. Joe? When back in the 70s, my brother Tom came home to tell my parents about this movie that he had seen. And in order to describe it to my parents, he said it was a Western. <laughs> and, okay. and I mean, I, I feel like that there's a, a precedence for that analogy when Star Trek, the TV series, was pitched to the network. It was pitched as, you know, the uh, the wagon train in space. So, uh, or, or more recently, uh, and much more obviously, you have the Firefly TV series that was very obviously a post-Civil War Western that happens to be in outer space. I would disagree about Star Trek. I think it's actually earlier than the Western. I th I'd call it a space frontier um, genre because they're pulling more from the Napoleonic age rather than the post a civil war age, I think. And then, and then now you can describe Star Trek as the violent, horrible, miserable science fiction war show, just like everything else. Well, that's because if you look at the Star, Star Trek from like a historical perspective, there is an element of uh, colonialization that goes into it oh, because right. you know they're they're out there making contact with you know strange new worlds and new civilizations to you know steal their stuff and you know get their oil <laughs> you know it's space oil it's still yeah. crystals or whatever but it's it's same same now now the the problem is that you both answered my star wars question uh different than what i would say which is <laughs> It's a sci-fi samurai film. But then what's the difference? What's, okay, what's the difference in a Western and a samurai film? Um, nothing, because Western films are are uh, stolen from samurai films, but that's a different conversation altogether. No, no but, you're absolutely correct. Westerns and samurai films, oh, the films are stolen from each other. I actually, I'd say that the, the, you're thinking of the spaghetti westerns, which are stolen from samurai films. The westerns themselves, I wouldn't say, are stolen from samurai films. Sure, But sure. the western and the samurai film feel the exact same niche, which mm -hmm. is also the same niche I'd put a wushu, which is a Chinese genre, into, which <clears throat> is the legendary knights errant, if you want to go back to the Arthurian, uh, the French and British Arthurian tales. They are the, the legendary uh, knights errant tales for a specific nation deal. So the Western is for the American nation view. The, the Arthurian knight is for the English um, view. The, uh, the samurai is for the Japanese nation view. But they're all, they're all basically some sort of morality tales based around the, the, the epitome of what the hero and what good and evil is for that society. So yeah, I'd say that actually, I'd say that samurai, Westerns, Arthurian, and the the fourth thing I mentioned, which I've forgotten now, <laughs> are all basically the same genre to some extent, just with different a different lens of a different nation view in each case. And I have a feeling that listeners are probably the ones who aren't already like super into this. Their heads are probably spinning. But <laughs> you um, mean they're turning this off and going to look at some other thing on YouTube at this point? Yes, I kind of agree. With yeah, you. they're going to watch Markiplier <laughs> scream at video games or something. <laughs> uh, but is it just this is this is a general question i have i have my answer to this already but is this is it worth breaking things down into this much of a granular like 
Star Wars as a space opera western samurai film with laser swords? Like, is it worth getting that narrow? Well, with, let's bring it back to libraries. Um, this was something you were talking about with me earlier because you just were working on this for your own project. What we're basically looking at here are subject headings to yes. some extent. Um, this, these are subject headings produced by uh, uh, corporations, basically, to market things to people. And the question I put to you is, um, some, some libraries have thought about doing this. In fact, uh, the library that, um, the public library in my own hometown did this for a while. I don't know if they still do it, but they actually had the science fiction section. They had the Western section. They had the mystery section. They had the the romance section of, of their collection. That's typically not how libraries divide those things up to some extent, um, but they were certainly doing it that way. Um, and do you think that is the way it should be done? Because obviously that's the way bookstores do it. No, because we're not a bookstore. And also the Library of Congress system kind of has that taken care of. I mean, there, there are some, usually they, they um, these, especially fiction books are, are more divided by like author than they are genre. But I have, I feel like, by looking at an author, you kind of have an idea of what their general style is going to be. But I think that a, a perfected version of this would be able to blend genre and author as you can find them on the shelf so that you, you have an idea of what the call number range represents as, as far as like finding things you specifically want to look for. But we're not there yet. No. Well, and I... I don't know that that's really true. I mean, there there's a problem with doing the division in that way. And one of the problems is that you have authors that write in more than one genre. And then it becomes difficult because you may have someone come in who is actually looking for all of the books by that author. Uh, and if you actually have all of them together, that would be great so they can find all of the books by that author. But if you have the author who has history books and historical fiction and cookbooks, and it's all the same author, those aren't gonna be in the same place. Uh, and, and I don't know that they necessarily should be, but that that is a thing. And then you have all of the things with uh, subgenres and the things that do cross genre or multi genre or defy genre, uh, and and it can be problematic. And those things, yeah, those are those are just I would say getting more complicated over time because yeah. you go. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, well, it's, uh, or I, I know that almost everybody is looking at some sort of uh, entertainment platform, whether you do Netflix or Hulu or Vudu or whatever. <clears throat> and the idea of genre is clearly exemplified when you look at those because you will see exactly the same movie mm -hmm. listed in half a dozen different categories. Yeah. Exactly the same movie may be listed as an action, a comedy, a drama, a romance, a horror story, and it's and it's still the same movie, but they're, and they do it for a couple of reasons, but, but one of the reasons is because there actually are elements of each of those genres in the movie. Uh, and part of it is because, you know, they just want to give you different things to catch your eye uh, or they're, you know, trying to push a specific title, but, but you, you have that. And so the genre issue can become muddy, but I do think that the reason for it and the reason we have all of the subheadings is to try to fit the book with the audience and the audience with the book. I totally agree with you there. Uh, the, I think the, the more, like, probably the most interesting aspect of this is that when you really break it down, everything can fit into one category with just a 
bunch of subgenres just kind of lifting it up. And by being able to weave these different types of what you would normally expect in a different genre into something and then making that its own product, mm -hmm. that's that's really the mark of, of something that's unique. Like yeah. cyberpunk was, you know, it's it's still sci-fi. I keep going back to cyberpunk because that's the easiest I, I feel to really to really discuss, but it was it was new when when something like Philip K. Dick was writing. That was a uh, that was its own thing for the longest time. And now everyone writes Blade Runner ripoffs, you know, like that kind of idea has become its own thing after it was originally an attempt to try something new. Sure. Well, it was it was a literary movement, and I think the problem with 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 literature today is that it's too diverse to some extent. Sure, uh, yeah. Which is a good thing. It's a good thing. You have more authors out there than we've ever had before. There are international authors. There are um, there's a wide variety of people getting into the market of writing and stuff <laughs> like that. Back in the day of the early late seventies, early eighties, where cyberpunk was coming into the fold, there were only a few venues that would publish science fiction. So you could get these these great artistic movements like cyberpunk or the movement that which was before it, which was I would which was. Uh, the new wave science fiction, or the, the movement before that, which was Campbellian science fiction. There's these movements of, 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 of genre that can happen within the science fiction field. Can you tell I, I've taken classes on the science fiction field? <laughs> uh, that, that occur over time. And you're not seeing that so much uh, today. I think it's also a, a, a factor of postmodernism, which is a, another type of, of movement. But one of the factors of postmodernism is the idea that you blend these, these ideas together to create multiple genres and stuff and, and things of that nature. So um, it is a problem nowadays that there aren't these singular movements. And I think cyberpunk, the reason you're talking about it, it was one of the, one of the last real artistic movements in uh, – genre literature to some extent yeah i'd agree with that well i think that i i because i feel like cyberpunk happened um kind of as a as a response to something that had been happening with science fiction for a while because uh you had i think a typical thing in the early days of science fiction was where you had your man versus science and then you have your cyberpunk that puts the man and the science in one body where you have your you know people jacking into the matrix because they have the cybernetic enhancements in their brain that allows them to do so uh you know and and i think that it was it it, it kind of reminds me of the the thing that uh, joss whedon talked about when he did buffy the vampire slayer because he was talking about how uh, he always felt sorry for the little blonde girl running away from the monsters in the monster movies. And he thought, well, wouldn't it be great if the little blonde girl just turned around and, and, and defeated the monster? And that's why we have Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you know? So I, I do think that cyberpunk did that. And I mean, I got to look at William Gibson, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Mnemonic and uh, Mona Lisa Overdrive and all that stuff. Uh, and... And that's what he did is he, instead of having the, the science be the thing you're fighting, it had, it, it was your, your ally. Well, how he defined it is um, the science fiction before that was um, showing all the wonders that science fiction can do. I mean, sorry, all, showing all the wonders that technology could do. Uh -huh. And what and his stories were about the fact that, yeah, but you know, a, a, a street sweeper is going to use this. Uh, the, the fact that, um, it's going to have new uses that you didn't even think about. Like someone built it to do this, somebody else is going to take it and use it for something completely different. And so I think he would say that um, his science uh, cyberpunk is about technology and having the underclass, having the disadvantaged use it in new and interesting ways in which it was not seen before. Is how I think how he would define cyberpunk. But it, which is which is ex exactly the sort of thing you're saying, just in a different different perspective. Yeah. And I think yeah, the reason I can see it that way. I think the reason why I, I'm also kind of obsessing over cyberpunk right now is uh, earlier you mentioned um, low tech in, yes. in the in the realm of sci-fi, 
where cyberpunk is uh, high tech but low life. That's that's uh, classically the definition for cyberpunk. But what that means is, I mean, that means different things to different people, sure. especially now with anyone can can write their own really unique uh, cyberpunk stories. Yeah. Um, well, in in the uh, short story Johnny Mnemonic which should in no way be confused with the movie that is based <laughs> on it. <laughs> that Gibson um, wrote the script to that. Gibson actually wrote the script to it. I <laughs> Sure. That's a separate <laughs> argument. But, um, in the short story, when Johnny goes to negotiate with someone, he has an inner dialogue about when they expect you to be high tech, go low tech. So he went into the meeting with a sawed off shotgun. <laughs> uh, and and I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, it's 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 sort of like, you know, taking a switchblade to a laser gun fight. Sometimes the switchblade can win just because it's completely unexpected. I can see that. That's interesting. I, I've never, I've never read Johnny Mnemonic, but I, I know, I know plenty of things about the movie, and and I am also fully aware of why I should avoid that one. <laughs> uh, it's in a collection of short stories called Burning Chrome. Um, I've been told, I've been told to read all that. Of the stories are cyberpunk, uh, but but that's where you'll find it. The majority of them are. I think there's only two stories in there that aren't cyberpunk. Everything else is. I've yeah. been harassed into reading that one. Uh, and you still have point. it. I have told you many times to read that book, and you still yeah. haven't. I've been, I'm busy. <laughs> I, I can I can actually finally say I'm busy, and it be real right now. Can I can can I do a rant? Can, can I yeah. have a little rant corner for a second? Of course. Yeah. What is with all the the punk suffixes out there? I mean, <laughs> yes, cyberpunk is an actual movement, <clears throat> but it seems to me like steampunk and gear punk and diesel punk and and fantasy and magic punk are all kind of, I don't know, artificial flavors, I guess. They're, they're kind of artificial flavors of genre that people are, are basically saying, hey, I'm going to take the punk stuff, but just stick gears on it. And now it's and now it's and now it's steampunk type of idea. So well, well, because it is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I think that f first of all, I agree that there's probably it's probably an overused term. But specifically with the cyberpunk and the steampunk, I I feel like the punk meant sort of what it did with, you know, the punk music uh, movement, that it has this sort of down with the man aspect to it, uh, of a rebellion against the status quo, and especially uh, if that status quo has to do with societal divisiveness absolutely the villain in in most of these punk stories are society or i mean you know not to not to fall back on the we live in a society meme but uh really in, in a lot of these it's that the main protagonists are in some way victims of their society and they're trying to either escape from it or rise above it and that's what the problems I have with steampunk, because a lot of times in steampunk, the protagonist is not the underclass, it's the young lord or the young lady of some sort, dressed in the fine Victorian outfit. Because in, it's not really steampunk, it's really neo-scientific uh, romance from 100 years ago is what it is to some extent. That, well, see, that, that that's a thing that happens, though, because I feel like sometimes people take a, a genre and turn it into a setting. Sure, but um, the the I think the important parts of specifically steampunk and cyberpunk those are the like those are the big ones, right? Um, yeah. Th those are like it's not like either of those genres were created to like as a form of like making this this marketable thing. Um, one of the first works of, I've never read this before, but one of the first really important works of uh, cyberpunk is Neuromancer. 
And, and of course, you can go back to Burning Chrome. This is uh, William Gibson. Same William, universe, by the way. What's yes. that? Uh, oh, yeah. the yeah. Most of the stories in Burning Chrome take place in the same universe as uh, Neuromancer. Yeah, within the yeah the Neuromancer cinematic universe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, the bodyguard from Neuromancer originally appeared in Johnny Mnemonic, which is in Burning oh. Chrome. Oh, okay. Interesting. And but, she's had, she has different names because they call her Molly Millions or Sally Shears, but it's the same character. Oh, I see. Well, the thing with the thing with that work is that um, okay, so Neuromancer, written by William Gibson, uh, one of the one of the fathers of the the cyberpunk genre. There are there are probably a few more before him. I think Philip K. Dick probably falls into cyberpunk. Uh, in he's a little. Uh, I, some of his work falls into um, cyberpunk. Uh, Codwater Smith is another writer who wrote during the 50s who's very cyberpunkish. Um, I would not call um, uh, Phil, um, um, uh, Samuel R. Delaney is another character who's written very science, uh, very cyberpunkish type stories. I would call those um, proto um, cyberpunk, honestly. Proto, yeah. Uh, Whereas because not all the stories were like that, but some of the stories they wrote were like that. And Philip K. Dick is probably <clears throat> a lot of his stories were very cyberpunkish, but it was really before the movement took off. Uh, Gibson. Uh, Neil Stevenson and some other writers as well were really the guys pushing for this new type of genre. Well, the interesting thing here is that William Gibson also wrote a novel, uh, co-authored a novel with one Bruce Sterling, uh, another science fiction author. This novel is titled The Difference Engine. I don't know if either of you two have, have read this read book. You, you read, have you read this, Joe? I have not read that one now. I, I'll let, I'll I'll swing by your office tomorrow if you're here and, and drop it I off. I won't be here tomorrow. Okay. Oh, that's uh, right. You won't be here for and, the and, rest and, of the week. And I'm not going to read anything until the semester's over. Okay. <laughs> well, remind me when the semester's over. I'll I'll drop it off for you. But the Difference Engine is the first steampunk work, probably ever, is written. I'm looking at the Wikipedia article written in 1990. The the premise of it though is that. Um, the computer technology takes off way too early. It's like in the 1800s, uh, mm -hmm. and it's 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 operated by punch cards. And the I think the the big conflict is that a series of punch cards has accidentally caused these um, pre computers to gain some form of sentience, mm -hmm. and the technology is not up to to the point that it can that it's compatible with like artificial intelligence. So anything that the, that these punch cards are operated on just break mm -hmm. <laughs> because like they, they, they're not up to the point where if, if the same technology were made, you know, in the, in the nineties or the eighties or whatever, it would have been, uh, it would have made more sense, but because the technology is much more advanced than it should be, the the era the the victorian era is kind of compensating for it uh -huh. it's not steampunk because steampunk would be cool it's steampunk because there's it, it, the the difference between steampunk and cyberpunk is generally high life low tech low tech high life or high high tech low life um it's it's really a matter of the author i mean you know it's it's william gibson he has a lot of sci-fi authors have this this idea of let's let's just try something new in a new setting sure. and that's all that's all this book is and suddenly you have everyone with their own ideas of what steampunk is and really it really i mean that it the idea is that a tentpole work like this can create its own genre just by virtue of its quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, once again, I'd say it's really just a revival of scientific romance. I mean, uh, the stories in steampunk that I've actually read are no different than the stuff that Verne was doing or that Wells was doing. Oh, sure. Or right. that um, uh, Moorcock actually did a series of stuff in the 70s, which is extremely steampunkish. So, um, yeah. Uh, well, I, and, see, I think... and I would actually, I would actually point at at Wells and Verne as as being early steampunk authors. I would too. Um, 
and uh, Ian Fleming with Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, or if you go out of literature to the audiovisual uh, world, you got to look at Wild Wild West because Wild oh. Wild West is absolutely steampunk, and that was the '60s. Sure, <clears throat> but I think a consideration here is: Do you real? Does it really like it, in that case? And this is something I've thought about before: Is it just pure sci-fi if the era it was written in? is speculative you know like something like the time machine i, I think it is by wells or, or something to that effect where it's it it's comes across as steampunk because that's their speculative idea of what sci-fi like what a futuristic world is whereas with with say gibson or, or your modern steampunk writers it's a it's a deliberate looking back and and kind of a more historical look at technology that's that's in a bygone era whereas with us i mean what's cyberpunk to us now even something like um the original alien which is you know it, it is science fiction but a lot of their technology like their their computers and and a lot of the the tech aspects of, of their ships are ugly green ms dos propped computers where that looks quaint to us now. Yeah, but you still get that in other genres. I mean, you have something like the, um, was it the late 70s, early 80s Flash Gordon? Or even something like Buzz Lightyear, I think is pulling from a much earlier version of science fiction from the 50s. Or in the case of Flash Gordon, from the 30s. Well, I mean, I, I guess you have sort of like the art deco literature. Yeah. Which is <laughs> when, when you... Are, are imagining what the world could be like 20 to 50 years in the future. And you're like, oh, well, it's going to be, you know, this way. Um, I think that when when you look at what we're calling our, our major punks, you know, steampunk and cyberpunk, you're looking at an anachronistic use of technology. With steampunk, you're looking at machinery doing things that machinery in the time period was not capable of doing and with cyberpunk you're looking into the future like that you know that art art deco literature and going okay well within 50 years we'll have machines that can do this um i have a book at home i don't remember the name of it but it's basically it's an exploration of um science fiction historically so what people in like 1900 thought was going to be the future what people in the 1920s thought the future would be what people in the victorian age thought thought the future was going to be and it's really fascinating for example um most of the literature written around 1900 thought that naval warfare would all be ram ships because huh. of well because again if you remember in the civil war the merrimack and the uh what were the two ironclads that fought the merrimack and the monitor um with the two ironclads that fought each other and they fought each other to stand still because their guns weren't powerful enough to actually penetrate the iron sides of their ships so everyone speculated that's how the future was going to be and so guns would be useless against these ships so the only way they could fight each other is to ram each other and try to blow holes in each other and then we found out no what actually happens the gun technology caught up quite quickly and uh yeah um, that never happened. But if you read a lot of science fiction from like 1900, like I do, because I'm a weird person, <laughs> uh, one of the things you'll see is a lot of the navies are the, all these ideas, these ram ships instead of these gunships. Well, well, here's something to chew on. Um, this is this is kind of a, a art reflects reality here. I don't know the the term. There's a there's a like I said, I'm very tired. But uh, in World War Two, Japan was like obsessed still with with naval warfare that's one of the reasons why they lost so handily like they they were putting all of their bet on stuff like like the 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 yamato i think that's the big one they there's like it, i i read a lot of manga and watch anime and stuff and there's there's still this romantic romanticization of the yamato it's still brought up. There's there's that franchise, the Space Battleship Yamato. It's literally a gigantic naval ship in space where that would not make sense whatsoever. Yeah, that's 
I, I never really considered it like that, but, huh. Yeah, again, uh, the problem with, with by the time the Yamato was built, it was the largest battleship ever built. By that time, it was already obsolete because um, carriers and mm -hmm. uh, naval aviation had basically become the dominating uh, aspect of, of warfare at that time. And that's another thing, too. Um, this is interesting that this comes up. We talked about Star Trek and Star Star Wars. It's interesting because Star Trek, if, if you want to know what I feel, the difference between Star Trek and Star Wars is, and I mentioned it sort of before, Star Trek imagines everything to be based on like the great ships of the line of the Napoleonic age, while Star Wars imagines everything to be like the battleships and carriers and of World War II. And that's basically the difference between the two. And the actual truth of the matter is that in the future, it'd be more, probably be more like submarine warfare because it's not so much about, um, I mean, you're not going to have a plane, uh, spacecraft zipping through the air and you're not going to have these big spacecraft just sending barrages at each other. It's going to literally be, I spotted him. Okay, let's try to figure out a way to hit him with our missiles before he hits us with our missiles, even though he's, you know, half a light year away from us. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting how, how you know, their visions of how things are going to be are actually based not so much on what the future will actually be, but how um, how the future, how how the past was to some extent, how where how ship warfare was fought in the past, I guess is what uh, I'm trying to say. Call me a giant philistine, but um, comparing yeah those those battles in in Star Trek where it'll be people on the bridge and Picard will say uh, set the the torpedoes to whatever velocity, you know, and it's a bunch of calculations versus that awesome still amazing iconic shot from the first star wars of luke and han in their world war ii turrets you know pivoting and aiming at the the tie fighters like just a, as far as watchability goes that's a much more exciting action set piece but it also creates a different expectation of what that specific genre is aiming for yeah Again, on Star Trek, what you'll get instead of that, you'll get the bridge collapsing and 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 the lights are off and people are dead because apparently they don't what they don't know what capacitors are that can uh, or are circuit breakers that will that will stop the uh, the uh, the control panel from blowing up in their face. They don't understand that technology at all. Um, but you'll see all these dead people laying around the bridge. That's actually again from the Napoleonic age, where basically you know the they would fire shots into the crew and into the into the sails instead of into the ship, trying to kill the people aboard the ship and keeping the ship intact. That's what that's from, actually. So that again, that is the the idea that they're going for in in those type of shows. Where if you watch um, Star Wars, it's like one shot, get into the <laughs> reactor and kaboom, everything's blown up. You, Chris, I, I have to have my my little side rant because you mentioned the the Alien movie. Yeah. Uh, and I have a thing about that. It's one of uh, I feel like that those movies. Uh, let Let's specifically talk about the ones that have Sigourney Weaver in them. So you know, Alien One through Four, mm -hmm. um, and that's a thing where they took a genre and turned it into a setting, and actually did it as different genres because your setting is space. You know, and a lot of people think that sci-fi is space, and that's what you have when you have sci-fi. But your first Alien movie, it's a horror movie. It's a monster movie. That's a it's slasher, a slasher movie. movie. Yeah. You know, yes. a, and then Aliens, the second one, is an action movie. Oh, yeah. The third one is a drama. Then when you get to the fourth one, then you actually have sci-fi. The third one is a, is a take a nap movie. I, it, it, get, it 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 has its moments. Get cozy. But, uh, and... <laughs> yeah, uh, but the, most of them aren't good moments. But you know, it, 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 <laughs> I would say the third one is science fiction in the fact that it's a and the real monster was man all along type type movie. Oh yeah, there you go. That's that's the <laughs> that's well, the, I, the quintessential. I think, I think that you get that in all of the alien movies because you have your capitalist overlords trying to figure out how to make a profit off the darn things a aliens uh, yeah that's you know I, that's that's one of these these arguments that are that are eternal 
you know, is is Alien or Aliens the better film? And then you ask the action person which one the better film is, they're gonna say, oh, obviously Aliens. That's you know, that's yeah. a that's a perfect action movie. You ask the horror person, they're gonna say Alien because it's a, a near perfect horror movie. Wow, but they're both sci-fi movies. It would be nice if we could create some sort of template or some sort of I don't know word that can describe everything that's the same sort of thing that would help <laughs> people find what type of type of movie they want to they want to watch. Well, we're we're getting kind of long in this in this episode here. Um, there's something that I wanted to bring up though, and it's non-literary genres because this is something that I'm kind of wrapping my head around with um, with my class right now, where. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a collection of role-playing games, and the first few things about the genre there have nothing to do with literary. It's, this is the role-play, like, this is the turn-based genre of games. This is the strategic genre of games, where we use the same word, and we kind of use the same type of breakdown of, of what that genre means, but... It has nothing to do with that same type of, of fiction. And you can say this is a horror game, but you play it like this. This is a, you know, this is a first person shooter, but it's also a role playing game. So is there, do you think ever going to be a moment where we find new types of mediums that have their own type of classification and genre? Sure. I mean, you, you just did it to some extent, because what you're talking about is mechanical genres. You're talking about the mechanics of it rather than the themes of it. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely an aspect of it, um, of, of, of genre to some extent. And I'm trying to think if you get that in other types of, um, other types of mediums, um, maybe in art a little bit as well. You talk a little bit about the mechanics of, 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 of visual arts, for example, as opposed to, um, as opposed to maybe the themes of it. Um, oh sure, yeah, like impressionist and, mm -hmm. and uh, modernist, cubist, modern, yeah. and they have their own styles and their own specifications for for how that art looks. Mm -hmm. And then that's a thing about the mechanics of how the piece was created, but doesn't have anything to do with its subject matter. Mm -hmm. Right. So those are interesting things to to kind of oh. chew on. Also, again, also the medium it's in. So. Um, Watercolor, acrylic, um, uh, uh, chalk, uh, pencil. Those are also ways of, of talking about at least, uh, I guess, medium genre. They kind of mix together in those those aspects. So, well, and I was wondering about that too with your games because I didn't know if because I feel like your games still have a genre because you can have your space combat game that's science fiction or your zombie fighting game that's horror slash action or whatever and then you have the thing about how the game is played the mechanics of the game versus the genre of the storyline and it made me kind of think a little bit just about the different sort of media we have with uh, being able to take in a story because we have print books and even our print books are in different formats, uh, paper, paperback, hardback, your mass markets, or, you know, an audio book. And those things, the, the media doesn't have anything to do with changing the genre. I think what both me and, and, and Joe are trying to tell you, and I think we're right <laughs> about this, is you need to have you need to distinguish genre like the classical literary genre from mechanical genre. You need to come up with another term for it. Um, I think you're right um, to to basically differentiate um, those type of aspects to things, which would be unique to um, role playing games. And and that's just that's just one one specific medium. Then you get to I mean, music has its own genre. Everything when you break it down, it's just like an endless well of of how we interact with with the things that we enjoy well and 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 of course that's that is one of the things about genre is is that we use aspects of genre when we are are doing uh readers advisory because we're asking people what it is they like about the things that they've read so that we can guide them to their next read and, and that's crucial 
it's very important, especially for what we do. Absolutely. Well, I think we're, uh, I think we've probably, we could go into this. I think <laughs> this has kind of become my, my send off now is we could keep talking about this for days and weeks even, but, uh, I think we've we've hit upon a really interesting and maybe even thought-provoking subject. So, uh, listeners, why don't you let us know about some of the just some of the genres that maybe we didn't hit upon, or or some of the genres that you think are maybe coming up or are interesting to you? Or Ryan, tell us you where any... we messed up on genre. Oh, please, yes, please <laughs> correct us. I can't wait to read those comments. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, anything else you'd like to add? Um, well, I mean, I know that we sort of loosely talked about genre, but, uh, some, someone might get the idea that we're, you know, mostly obsessed with, uh, science fiction. <laughs> but I, 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 I don't know where they could get much that. The fieldhouse that we stayed in, like, let's talk about the divisions of science fiction and just sort of <laughs> left out that there's actually any other kinds. Oh, you sure. Know, like of course. Westerns or historical fiction or relationship fiction or, you know. Any of the other types of of, of uh, genre? Oh, we could get into fantasy. You know, there's we could talk about sword and sorcery fantasy, or dark oh, yeah. fantasy, or low fantasy, high fantasy. Absolutely. But I think something like sci-fi is easy to to kind of break into what we what we mean here. Sure, sure. Well, science fiction is considered a major genre, yet it's so um small it's so it's so narrowly focused in some to some extent yeah i could agree with that yeah there's there's truth well let's wrap it up here guys because we're we're going on an hour and 20 minutes now so <laughs> and and we'll edit it down to 30 minutes i'm sure yeah we will, we will. <laughs> it's been really fun joe i hope you uh i hope that we can have you on sometime in the future it's been Absolutely. a great uh been a great episode been really fun Okay, well, I'm, I, I, I hope I wasn't uh, too, too dull. Or oh, no, not at all. I, I, I know that I gave Ryan a lot of editing work to do, so I'm sorry about that. It, it happens every week. Yeah. Uh, no, he'll be bashing his head against, against any other podcast that we do, so I think this will be, be all right. Okay, good. Thanks, Joe. Well, everyone, uh, I know that there was a big gap in our podcast scheduling, and we're, we're probably going to have gaps like that from time to time. So um, these these podcasts are our special treats to you. So um, we hope that you enjoy them. Let us know how you feel. Uh, and we'll see you next time around. So from everyone here at Club Moffat Talks, uh, have a good day. <laughs>